so um, we were right in the middle of talking about experimental design, which is a really important, really important subject for the science student and the biologist. And I wanted to discuss the characteristics of a good experiment. So this is basically going to be our model, a generalized model for an experiment, and, and we'll highlight the characteristics out of there that are going to be important. So we always want to make sure the experiment is properly controlled. And the term control is going to reference a couple different things. One, it's going to reference the presence of a control group. The control group typically is going to be a group that doesn't receive any sort of experimental intervention. Typically, they're going to be treated with a placebo, or we may not even do anything. If we're looking at maybe rates of cancer treatment or um, things like that, it may be the de facto or the typical cancer treatment, whereas the experimental group, which is what we're going to compare to, is going to receive new treatment. So a controlled experiment is going to have a control group and an experimental group that are going to be compared. What happens in the control group is compared to what happens in the experimental group. If there's a difference, then we have something that's interesting going on. If there's not a difference, then perhaps that new drug doesn't really do anything special. Now, in addition to having the control group and the experimental group, the way that we treat each of these groups, we really want to try to minimize the differences so that we can look at an individual thing that we want to observe. So let's say we're looking at a new chemotherapeutic drug, right? So we give the traditional treatment to the control group, this new treatment to the experimental group. Everything else that we do, how much sleep, how much food or what the types of food the individuals are eating, the amount of exercise they're getting, we want to standardize that. And so we want the treatment to be identical. So an identical treatment, with the exception of that one variable that we're trying to manipulate. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to control everything and have everything exactly identical and only have one single variable. We can manipulate a couple of variables. Maybe we're interested in how this new cancer treatment affects cancer therapy in a variety of different types of diet. And so we're going to control everything except for diet. That will be one of our experimental variables and then the cancer treatment. A fourth characteristic of a controlled experiment is going to reduce, in an ideal world, it would be eliminate, but at least reduce uncontrolled variables. So we reduce or eliminate uncontrolled variables. We have an animal housing facility down here. I know I might have actually smelled it because there's mice in there right now. That's what the smell is over in that hallway. That's mice. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you about that because in that room, we control when the lights come on and when the lights come off. We control the temperature in the room. It's always set to 70 degrees in that room and it doesn't really deviate. And so we're reducing or eliminating as many of those uncontrolled variables as possible. We don't just come in and randomly turn the light off. It's set to go on and off at 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every single day. I'm on the hour. I'm on the so it's very important that you identify what are the potential confounding variables that may have an effect that can cause your experiment or your results to be in some sort of weird way. All right, so a good experiment is going to be controlled. A good experiment is also going to be completed methodically. So in a good experiment, you work methodically. In 
what that means is if you need to collect data at 11 a.m. or 2 p.m. or 1 a.m., you collect it every single time at that same exact same time. You also work organized. A lab where you're collecting biological data should be one of the cleanest and most organized places in the world. I've worked in labs that are disorganized. My space could be really nice and organized and other people may have like old candy wrappers that strain on their workspace. And they'd be like, man, I can't get my experiments to work. I wonder why. <laughs> well, because you're a mess. You're a hot mess. You're disgusting. <laughs> so work organized. Keep area that you're doing your experiments. Even in labs, you can be I-107, keep those clean and safe well organized, it's going to help you to actually meet the objectives that you're trying to achieve. <coughs> Good experiments are, and really science in general, should be self-correcting. So there should be an inherent self-correcting nature. I'm going to expand on this just a little bit uh, on exactly what a self-correcting nature really means. New discoveries will inherently correct old discoveries. So it's not necessarily that that old discovery was, was wrong, per se, but maybe we didn't have the technology and the technique to be as stringent as possible. And so maybe there were some uncontrolled that were not controllable at that time. Now, 100 years later, there's a new discovery using new technology, new techniques, more control, and it changes the outcome just a little bit, or it may change it drastically altogether. But it was done with those old discoveries in mind. It was standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Is that term last time? And so the old discoveries lead to the new discoveries. The new discoveries change or correct the results because of the advancements that we have in other areas of science and technology. Now, this really is only going to work. what I'm going to quote as honest science. Only works for honest science. So what exactly does it mean to, for science to be honest? It's really to recognize a couple things. One, no scientist is an island. We don't work in a silo, we work in a community, right? So even in the I-107 lab, you have lab partners and there are other groups and it's okay for you guys to communicate with each other. Hey, this is kind of going weird, are you guys getting fire too? <laughs> no? Okay, we're doing something wrong then. So, even, even experimental scientists, research scientists, I don't just sit in my lab over here at the end of the hall by myself. I have people that I'm working with, and it's not just within TMC's population. I work with people at Queens University, at Texas A&M, and Michigan State as well. So we're working together because none of us are an island. The reason that this is so important is because it keeps that honesty alive. If you are secluded and you're doing your own thing and you're not communicating with anybody else, there is no check and balance. Now, I just proposed a really ideal idea, something that's a concept that's pretty ideal. Unfortunately, I don't think it's probably working in modern science. And certainly it's working in some places, but I don't know that it's working as a whole. Um, and I think that the 
rate of fabrication and falsification that we see in scientific data today is evidence that it's not working because that's higher than it's ever been. And really, going back to what we talked about on Wednesday, what's driving that? Money. It's being driven by money rather than natural curiosity. And whenever you involve money, some sort of pursuit as the end goal rather than curiosity being the driver of the experiment, you're going to have issues that arise. So, this is an article. It's the title here is "The Persistence of Error: a Study on Retracted Articles on the Internet and in Personal Libraries." And really, basically, what Dr. Davis did here is he looked to see, okay, how many articles and how much information is being retracted, and that means basically, oh, I'm taking it back. I got caught, and I made some mistakes. Now, some of them honestly were were real honest mistakes, and it was. Uh, uh, nothing malicious or with intent, but a lot of these articles that he talks about in this article, it was driven by a discovery. They needed to get tenure at their institution so they can continue to collect the paycheck, but they were trying to get that next million dollar grant, and so they fudged their data just a little bit. One of my uh, dissertation advisors, she was a postdoctoral fellow, so that's after her PhD. She did a fellowship at Stanford University. And at Stanford University, she was working on muscle repair. And her experiments, they'd come in and go by the book, and she wouldn't get any results. She said, what's going on? I should be getting something. And she kept on doing this for about six months. And she came in early one morning, 6 AM. And there was another postdoc who was working in the exact same lab as her. And she didn't realize that they were competing. And she came in, and she found out that that other postdoc was urinating on all of her students. Every morning, she'd come in and pee. Not very honest. But she was doing it because in that lab, it was competitive enough that if you had good data, you got more funding, and you could do more science, which was better for your career. Uh, I did a postdoctoral fellowship as well. I was at Virginia Tech for 18 months before I came to Truett. And I, uh, I operated as a lab director there. And my immediate supervisor, I found out, had fabricated a bunch of data. She fabricated the grant that she was paying my salary off of. And there was no possible way for me to get the results that she was expecting because she initially you know, the, the trial results or the um, the initial small subject sample results. She just made up the thing. So I was like, OK, 18 months here, what do I do now? Because it wasn't honest. There was no checks and balances. So it's not working. And we're seeing a considerable amount of retraction. But we got to change that. And you can change that in your own lives as you go through your undergraduate career here. And eventually, a lot of you are going to go on to graduate or professional work honest in what you're doing. The future, where we're going, needs to be built on the past. We need to recognize, though, that the past is probably littered with dead ends and irreproducible data. And so we have to be cognizant of that, not that we have to ignore that or can't ignore that, but we need to recognize that that's out there and that we should question and be critical and be skeptical of everything. So good experiments are controlled, they're methodical, they're organized, they're self-correcting. The future is always built on the past. And then importantly, those experiments need to be reproducible. There needs to be repetition. In other words, you don't just do it once. You do it twice. You do it three times. And it may not be the exact same experiment, but it's just a short little deviation. Kind of a, if this is what you're looking at, it's a kind of shift in your focus. And, and you're continually sort of circling around that to get to the answer. Although in some cases it might be the exact same experiment, especially if you really are questioning the results.
good experimental science is going to involve open discourse. Open discourse. And what that means is that it's an open conversation. It's not one science, science is saying this is the way that it is, this is the truth, and this is reality. It's science is saying, look what I've just found, look what I've just discovered, what do you think about that? And having an open dialogue. And there's a variety of formats and forms that we utilize that you need to sort of be aware with, aware of and understand the process to make sense of the things that you're going to begin to read in your textbook and the things that you're going to begin to read in other um, other articles and things like that as you progress through your degree program. We have this thing called peer review. It's a process. Scientific journals are different than popular journals. Right? Popular journals, things like Time Magazine or maybe the Washington Post, is not the same as nature or science or endocrinology or a whole host of scientific journals. There is a rigorous peer review process. You do your science, you come to your conclusions, you write up your results, and you write up the paper. You submit that paper to the journal, and they have typically two or three experts in the field read through everything that you've done, and they critique it and analyze it and assess everything. They look for the errors. They look for any complications or problems. If there are a minimal number of issues, they may tell you, yeah, this looks really good. Why don't you revise it, address a couple of these concerns that we have, and then you can resubmit it, and we'll consider it again, and then it'll be published. Or if you find mountains and mountains of Core science, they'll write back and say, Thank you for your article. It was enjoyed to read this. Here are some major issues that we found. We're not going to consider your article anymore for publication. I told you on Wednesday, I think I mentioned that I was reviewing an article. I solidly rejected the article because the methodology was too poor. And so I'm part of the decision making process in this peer review. It's peer because, right, I'm an expert in the field reviewing another expert in the field, their work, and saying, here are some issues that I've noticed. Correct these if you can. If not, then this is not the journal for you. Does that mean that sometimes science goes by the wayside and you spend, I mean, this, this article that I just read, I would say they probably spent $25,000 on it. And it's not going to be published in the journal that they have spent it. So does that mean that $25,000 is just a complete waste? In some cases, yeah, it might be. It might be totally uncorrectable. I actually think that they might be able to correct some of the problems, not all of them, and so they can improve the science just a little bit. And so there's different kind of levels of, uh, of peer review journals. On. The journal they apply to only publishes the top 20% of articles. There are other journals that are going to they're going to publish a much larger number of articles. And in, in some cases, they may be, I hate to use the term poor quality, but poor quality articles. So the science still may get put out there, and because it's not totally useless unless it was fabricated or falsified. But there is prestige in the peer review process, and only the most prestigious journals get published, or articles get published in the most prestigious journals. Another way that we have open discourse is through scientific meetings. So through scientific meetings. And typically at scientific meetings, you have a variety of different formats. You may give an oral presentation, use PowerPoint and describe your experiment or your scientific or maybe a poster, which is actually what you all are going to do towards the end of the semester. You're going to generate a, a big format poster that has the scientific information on it. Figures and data and introduction and results and discussion and the methodology that was used. So scientific meetings are this format where a bunch of scientists from a similar field fly together in an individual location. I was in a, uh, at a conference in San Diego and and it was 
10,000 of the best and brightest, well, I'm not the best and brightest, it's going to be all that there. It was 10,000 exercise scientists, sports medicine, athletic trainer, exercise physiologists, experimental biologists working in the area of exercise and universe, all gathered together for four days talking about science in a variety of different formats. So you can go to scientific meetings and have those conversations. You can also just simply have personal communication. I need to do this, but I don't know how to do this, but I know someone who might I can give them a call. Just so pick up the phone or you send them an email, and you have to stay personal conversation. Now, all three of these, if you really think about it, you have scientists interacting with each other in a variety of different ways. And it's kind of like the sports field for the nerd, right? The scientific article is the basketball court for the science nerd. And so it becomes competitive. That's not how this book out. So just naturally, this increases competition. And so you have to be aware that you are competing with your fellow classmates, with fellow students at the institution, and eventually it may be fellow employees or faculty members if you go on for a PhD or something like that. That camp competition is inherent. It's really human nature. It shows up in a variety of different places, including in science. This competition can actually be extremely healthy. Even on a sports team, you're competing against your teammates. But if you can compete in such a way that it's friendly, that, then it becomes advantageous. If you can compete to work together, it becomes advantageous. And the same goes here in science. If your competition is friendly, meaning you're not urinating in other people's experiments, you can lift each other up. You can build off of each other scientifically, so to speak. So competition needs to be friendly in order for it to be a good experimental setting. If it's cutthroat, if you do decide to urinate on my friend's experiments next week, it's cutthroat, that's going to be adverse. It's going to be cross the lines. And neither of you are going to win. So I'm going to shift gears here in just a second, but are there any questions on anything that's possible at this point? So basically, the first portion of the lecture today and, and, and last time, you got some practical experience in lab on Wednesday, dealing with experimental design and things like that. The next position of the pinnacle of science, so to speak, from experimentation, which is what you see down here. This is the experimentation portion of this figure. And eventually, if it's consistent, it leads to the development of this thing called a theory. So a theory in science is sort of the next step up from experimentation. You have a bunch of experiments that go really well, and they're all consistent you may be able to develop a theory. So let's briefly talk about the use of theories in science and talk a little bit about what they are and what they are not. So to start out with, a theory needs to be based off of ideas from many hypotheses. hypotheses and experiments. So many hypotheses, many experiments, when they are consistently saying the same story, can be utilized together to become the basis for developing a theory. You do something two times and you get the same results, that's not a theory. We're talking about years and years and years of work. It may be hundreds of years of work from multiple different scientists. A theory needs to be comprehensive. Okay. 
So it needs to be this comprehensive collection of everything that went well, went right in experimentation before you can really begin to consider something in theory. I also, I'm, I'm kind of a cynic, I'm kind of cynical. Um, I think this is going bad too. Because when I survey the theories that are out there, I think that there are two types. And this is, you're not going to find this in the book. This is all really pretty and kind of okay. But, right? It's something for you to think about. Maybe you won't agree with me. That's all right, too. But I survey all of the different types of theories out there, and I think that there are two types. There are those that are popularized. And when I say popularized, that's actually a good thing. It's popular because it looks really good. Because it's going to be supported by a wide body of evidence. So it's popularized by a wide body of evidence. A couple theories that we are going to run into this semester, and really when, when you begin to think about a theory, it's really a model of all the way something works. It's humans, we have limited brain capacity, right? I'm not saying we're stupid, although some of us are. But our ability to look at a complex process, a complex thing, is kind of difficult. And so we kind of turn it into a model. And the model has different parts that help us to try to understand what's going on. So one of the theories, or one of the models, so to speak, that we'll run into is the cell theory. And there are five tenets to the cell theory, and we'll talk about those in a little while, actually a couple of days from now, I would assume maybe a couple of weeks. And when we get there, you're going to see, oh yeah, I can see where each of these tenets has come from. And there's wide bodies of evidence that feed into all life comes from cells, which is one of the tenets. There's no living thing. Viruses are not living things because they do not have cells. Another theory or model is homeostasis. And in fact, that becomes really the basis for the study of physiology. Homeostasis is, again, this idea that when we deviate environmentally and cause deviations in biology, the biology the biological system fights back and comes down towards a set, standardized set of conditions. Body temperature, if you increase your body temperature, let's say you go out for a run this afternoon and it's kind of hot out, body temperature is going to start to go up, then what happens? Sweat production increases and sweat moves away from the body to pull that heat away, and so the body temperature is maintained at a certain set condition. So the popularized theories, I'm, I'm pretty good with that. I think we also have a set of theories that are immortalized. And that's not a good thing. Immortalized means that they can never be killed, never be changed, right? And some theories ultimately get killed and get changed. Typically, these are going to be touted not by a wide base of evidence, but by a wide of lobby. Some sort of group that has some sort of bias, and they say this is the way that it is, and this is the only way that it can be. And it removes the skepticism that's naturally needed in science. And I got a couple examples here as well. If you didn't believe in the geocentric universe 500 years ago, you should have got killed. If you're killing your dissenters, if you're killing the people who oppose you, that's a pretty good way to control your ideas or your state preeminent ideas. Um, I would also say that the concept of macro evolution 
probably falls into this category of immortalized. Now that's, I'm actually going to play nice here. There's a lot of really great scientists who ascribe to theory of evolution, which we're going to call macroevolution, who are actually really great scientists and they're doing really good stuff. And it's not like we have this notion that the macroevolutionary theories or hypotheses and experiments that are present today are just completely junk science. They're actually, there's a lot of really solid science. And it's actually a really, really good explanation for the life that we see around us. Now, I think that there's a group of people who are very loud mouthed, Richard Dawkins comes to mind, that really don't support with much evidence besides just a few pieces of evidence that are pretty minimal. Um, does that mean that I'm saying that macroevolution, there's a bunch of people who are doing good science and they're, they're getting to a, a really good conclusion? No, it's actually that there's going to be competing ideas. Younger you know, creationism would be another idea that I think is equally valid and actually a little bit more valid because I think the science and the data that is present for macroevolution is weaker than for a young Earth creationist perspective. I would probably say that this is more along the lines of a still a hypothesis and it hasn't graduated to, to glory as a theory. Everybody good? We're now going to shift some shift gears here, uh, and I'm going to start to talk about biological themes. Okay, so biological themes. To start, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a definition right away of biological themes. I'm going to explain why we need biological themes first, and then we're going to get into the definition and the practicality of biological themes. In many scientists, or in many sciences, there's a wealth of new knowledge. So currently, the rate of new stuff that's being published in biology alone. So biology is a discipline, all the sub-disciplines of anatomy, physiology, microbiology, molecular biology, chemistry, uh, uh, biochemistry, cell biology, genetics, collectively biology. There's about a half a million new pieces of information or new scientific discoveries every year. So there's about a half a million new discoveries a year. And if you're a good scientist, you're going to keep track of all half a million, right? So by tomorrow, uh, there were going to be 675 new articles published after class today. I want you to read all of them and come prepared to discuss on Monday. No, I'm just kidding. Um, my dissertation, which is my main area of research, that's the part of biology I'm most intimate with, about 300 articles that I'm most intimate with. So that's a tiny, tiny little sub-fraction of not only the 500 new discoveries, but the millions and millions and millions of other discoveries that have come before, right? So how do I stay abreast as a scientist? How do I keep track of the newest discoveries? How can I work my way through science so I can step outside of the area that I study most and understand other areas like plant biochemistry. Which sounds incredibly boring. But I can actually hold my own in plant biochemistry if I really need to. 
the reason is because of biological reasons. Now, a theme, and maybe you've heard of themes before in places like music, and you can go to the music department over here, the music division, and you probably can talk or bring in a recording and play that recording, and they'll be able to say, oh, yeah, that's Bach, or that's Beethoven. Their area of expertise is music, and of all of the different composers that are out there, they can identify just by listening to a few seconds of the song. And it's because there are themes that come up. There are things that those com uh, composers do that come out of their music, right? There are biological themes, things that come out of the biological system that you can look at and you can say, I get that, because that's related to DNA, and I know DNA. So these biological themes, these are ideas that pervade all of biology. So there's this common footing that we can use, regardless of our specific subdiscipline, that will help us be able to interact with other disciplines within the biological world. So we have these themes or these major ideas that we all can work from in different areas of biology to understand not only our area of biology, but the science of biology as a whole. And I'm just going to go through and I'm going to give you some of these common footings or these themes that we can observe in all of the different subdisciplines of biology. So theme number one, hierarchical order. Every biological discipline, there is order within the chaos. And in fact, biology, which seems really random, plays by laws. And because it plays by laws, it plays in a very ordered manner. Just like societies that have laws are ordered societies, law, uh, societies that break laws are unordered societies, biology plays by those laws, and order arises out of the seeming chaos. There's pattern in the biological system. So what you're looking at here is what's known as the hierarchical order. It's a hierarchy because one builds on the other as we move up in perspective. Biological systems have a component of subatomic particles, which you don't see shown here. It would be right up here. Biology requires neutrons, protons, and electrons. And those come together to form atoms. So then we can begin to produce carbon, and we can begin to produce hydrogen, and we can begin to produce nitrogen, etc. Then we can take those atoms, put them together, and we can form molecules. So we don't just get hydrogen and oxygen, we put them together and we get water. We can take those molecules and we can put those together, and we can get organelles. Mitochondria, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum. Take the organelle, put it together with other organelle, and you get the cell. Take the cell, put it together with other types of cells, and now you have a tissue. So we're going from a tissue from cells to tissues, tissues to organs, organs to organ systems, organ systems, 11 of them in, in mammals collected together to form the organism. Multiple organisms are a population, multiple, population, or, uh, multiple populations within the environment is the community and the ecosystem. A variety of ecosystems gives rise to the biosphere. And there's an order in all of this. You don't look at plant genetics, and plant genetics doesn't use cells. Plant genetics still uses cells, just the same as endocrinology uses cells. You're going to find that plants also have organs. 
and they have tissues. And so this is present in all of those different disciplines. And so I may say, humans have epidermis and leaves have epidermis, and you recognize that both of those are tissues. Composition of different types of cells functioning together to generate a common physiological function. It's a barrier to the external environment that allows exchange. Okay, so that's theme number one. Theme number two is this idea known as emergent properties. Emergent properties. Emergent properties, and I'm going to give you a little more detail here than I did with hierarchical order. Emergent properties, this theme states that as you have increased order, we have new functional properties. So increased order leads to new functional properties. And I'm going to give you an example here. You can see that you take the cell and you put it together and you get the tissue. The cell on its own is just the cell, but then you add in that cell with other types of cells to form the tissue, and you go from just being a cell to now a tissue that can contract. And so contraction is that one of those emergent properties, a property that emerges out of the, out of the, the more complex. Another way, or another example here, let's take a single protein. A single protein on its own basically is going to do one thing. It's got pretty much one function. And so I'm going to call that a low function. It is a function, but it's a low function. It may allow one type of uh, ion to cross the cell membrane. Maybe it just allows sodium to go from the extracellular fluid to the inside of the cell. That's all it's doing. But then we take and we combine several different proteins into a system. And those proteins now are working on their own individual function, but collectively that function emerges this idea or this ability to catalyze glucose and provide energy for work. So this may be one chemical reaction. This is a series of chemical reactions leading to the production of ATP, which is our energy currency in the cell. And because we can now metabolize glucose because of multiple proteins that were put together into a more complex system, we have a bunch of stuff that we can do, a bunch of examples of emergent properties that are going to arise. This example here of being able to generate energy allows us to do work. We can contract muscle now. We can move nutrients across the digestive barrier into the bloodstream. So work and reproduction is another urgent property. Adaptation, the ability to respond and adjust to the environment. Homeostasis, the ability to maintain a specific internal condition. Another emergent property as we get up to the organism and then uh, up to the population level, problem solving. We can actually do science because of emergent properties. Metabolism would be another example of emergent properties. Now, 
Are these really simple to understand? Reproduction is simple to understand. Adaptability is simple to understand. Problem solving, what's that? Okay, I would argue that in diagrams you give you a small snippet. Put all of the diagrams together. Look at the male reproduction system, the female reproduction system, spermatogenesis, oogenesis, and kind of look at it all collectively. Really, really complex. Extremely complex. And so we run into this paradox. We have a complexity dilemma of life. Life or a living system is extremely complex. However, you and I, as humans, we have a very limited comprehension. I, have, I used to have these posters on my office wall that showed every biochemical reaction that occurred inside of a living organism or a living cell. And they were collectively together, they were about as big, about as big as the smart board. And the font was like about a six point font. I mean, it, this thing was just loaded, loaded and loaded and loaded. And you can step back and you can sort of make out some of the chemical reactions like glycolysis is a straight line and you have the circle of the Krebs cycle. You can see how I contract working. But there's 200,000 reactions that are occurring. To understand life, you may have to understand all 200,000 of some of these. That's complex, right? You can model and you can look at every small little intricate detail, but to step back and to real, really conceptualize the whole thing that's happening, a change up here affects chemical reactions down here. And all of those interactions, millions and millions and millions and trillions of data points all at one time is what you need to be able to understand. So it's very complex and that's a dilemma because we don't have that ability. We are limited in our comprehension. So, but just turn the lights off and head home because there's no way to survive this class, right? Emergent properties require us to attempt to look at these complex problems in some very interesting ways. And we'll have to pick up with that on Monday. That's like a future. What are we going to do?